Uh, lightning talks time. It's my favorite time of the day, I guess. Um, we actually have a lot more lightning talks than we have time for today, so hopefully we get through all of them. Um, which actually, it's why we're starting 15 minutes early, but uh, anyway. Um, so Grace Nolan is up second, but first we have uh, Jesse who's going to tell us about Code Lingo, and your time has started. Hi, I'm Jess. That's Matt, somewhere that ran away. Um, we're both working on Code Lingo, and I just want to quickly talk about ratcheting down technical debt. Uh, there's the Standish group, which does uh, the chaos report uh, annually. They've been doing it for over two decades, uh, so where they uh, do a study across the whole industry uh, to see how many software projects are successful. Um, by their definition of success, they've never found more than 30% of software projects industry-wide successful. Uh, the Gartner report uh, estimated technical debt to hit uh, globally one, tr one, one trillion dollars. Uh, so it's, a, it's an industry-wide uh, issue. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a tension, right, between uh, technical debt and, and features. Uh, managers and business owners like to take on technical debt because it allows you to get to market quicker. Uh, they, they, take a, they take the analogy literally. Um, the, uh, as, as engineers, basically we see technical debt like taking a, a, a rake, placing it upside down, and turning off the lights. Um, so there's, 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 there's quite a disparity between how managers see uh, technical debt and, and, and how engineers do. Nonetheless, uh, we all need to push out features and products to get money and, 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 and survive, so you have, to, you have to resolve the tension between, the, between these two. Uh, with code lingo, what you can do is actually add Claire, and Claire is a virtual mentor that you can add to your team, and she will help you manage uh, your technical debt at scale. Uh, so what we can see here is, as a pull request is coming in, um, Claire is going to say, uh, I see that you've added more uh, arguments to this function. Can you please take a, uh, make it take a data struct? Now, the important thing here is that this isn't a bug. It's not idiomatic Go or Python or anything like that. It's a particular style that has been made by a senior engineer in, in, in a project. Um, but the point is that Claire is guiding that change to happen when the developer's context is in that space, so you're reducing that, that, that context switching. Um, so she stops cargo cargo culting, so she reviews the, the pull requests as they come in to stop the cargo culting of technical debt. Um, and she guides the refactoring, which I just talked about, and she also praises you. So if you incidentally improve some code, and it actually uh, incidentally fixes some of the technical debt that the CodeLingo platform uh, has detected, you get praised, because she's about educating your contributors. She's not a linter. She doesn't just find all the bugs. How it works, basically it works with .lingo files in your, um, in your uh, re repository. And inside of .lingo, you just have uh, this. This is, this is literally all you have to do to write a tenant. And the tenant that I just described, this, this is literally all you have to, have to write. It's based on YAML. And then this is, um, this is a DSL. The, uh, the grammar of it is um, the BNF file is maybe 50 lines. You can learn it in a day. It just, it just works on node branches and, um, and leaf branches. So we're just writing a little pa a pattern here. Uh, this is a function. Um, so each one of these is a, is, is a fact. And you write a statement of facts. Um, and what facts are available to you are dependent on the lexicon that you pull in. Um, now, a lexicon can be, uh, it's a domain of knowledge relevant to uh, the software development process. So, uh, um, the, the, the back end of the lexicon is actually a Docker container, and inside that container, uh, you can use any language uh, to do any analysis that you like and define any logical facts uh, uh, relevant to a particular domain. So, for example, you could actually suck up a lot of the existing uh, analysis tools. Um, the other point here, you can see here, um, Funk is actually a uh, so it's an inbuilt common lexicon. So this will actually find a function in Python, Go, PHP, what have you. But then if you want to express more specific uh, facts or facts from different domains, you can pull that in. So this is actually quite cool here because we're talking about a function, but then we pull in the lexicon domain, and suddenly we're not just One talking minute. about a function. Sorry. One minute. One minute. Okay, cool. That's that's cool. Um, so talking of time, let's let's. That's exactly the point I want to make here. So now we're not talking about a function as a static bit of text in a file. We're actually talking about a function that exists in time. So we can now actually define a pattern that says, find the function, find the number of arguments that function has in the previous commit. So everything under here is in the previous commit. Assign that to this variable. And then we jump out here. And in the current commit, 
does, the, does this same function, find the same function in the current commit, does it have more than three arguments and more than the less, uh, more than more arguments than it did in the, in the past commit? And that's what enables Claire to do, uh, to do that review. And that's just one example of uh, one lexicon that you can pull in. You can pull in lexicons uh, that, uh, re really anything that you can think is, is logically relevant to the software development process and that you... And uh, thank you very much, Jesse. That was fantastic. <laughs> so uh, up next, we have uh, Marcus Holderman, but first, uh, Grace Nolan, who is going to tell us all about how to sell computer science. At least she will once she gets up here and sets up. Um. All right. Yeah, Grace Nolan. Okay. okay, hello. So one of the things that I've heard quite a lot at this conference so far is um, people's interest in computer science education and outreach. Um, and I recently was doing a research project which kind of talked quite a bit about this. Um, and I thought that maybe you might be interested in some of the things that I came across when I was um, doing these studies. So one of the um, top concerns uh, that people seem to have or problems um, are around perception. Mm -hmm. So um, stereotypes, we talk about this quite a lot. Um, and there was one study that I looked at where um, they did find that stereotypes were formed in about two minutes and these lasted for about at least two weeks. So they kind of checked in at different points in that two week period. And they found that for people who kind of contradicts those stereotypes were taken kind of like a little bit more seriously and people could envision themselves being in that role. So that study was around students talking to um, other students, like ones that were studying computer science and moving on to the next thing. Um, the next one that we looked at was um, computer science for social good. So this idea is around that you know, when you're talking about computer science, often people don't actually know what it means or what it leads to. Like, you know that medicine's gonna lead to being like a doctor or a surgeon or those kind of things, or doing law is gonna lead to like a whole manner of things, like lawyer, being prosecutor or whatever. Um, same with engineering, but a lot of people don't, still don't really know what doing computer science could lead to. Um, so some of the examples that uh, some of these researchers like looking at is like looking at um, like humanitarian free and open source software type things or using kind of disasters as a way of giving examples um, when in like group situations. Like for example, if you've got, um, it, there's been a natural disaster and everyone's in like a game stadium, um, how do you sort the people so they can get their rations and that kind of thing. Like so you can kind of use that for um, teaching computer science concepts. Um, the next thing was um, the importance of considering the context of the students that you're working with. So before going to, um, to work with a group of students, think about, think about them and think about where they're coming from and um, what their life is like and kind of try and tailor it to that. Um, but avoid pinkwashing if possible. If you're particularly targeting um, you know, female students, um, you want to be careful not to inadvertently perpetuate stereotypes by, you know, talking about like sewing and cooking examples and stuff like this, because people do that and it's not so great. Um, the next thing is the outspoken minority. So if you're working with a group of students and you have some students who, um, you know, they're really enthusiastic and they're bringing up all these points about lots of different technologies and it, you know, people, um, it can be quite off-putting for other students. Um, and I quite like the strategy that Maria Claude did from um, Harvey Mudd, where they would pull those students aside and be like, hey, it's really awesome that you're enthusiastic about this. Um, and you may not be aware of it, but you know, it can be a little bit off-putting to other students. Um, how about we talk about you know, some of these things that you want to talk about like offline? How about we talk about it you know, on the side and, and let the other students have the space to, to learn and that kind of thing? And that seems to have worked um, pretty well. Um, there's, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of CS Unplugged, um, which is some activities that Tim Bell uh, has been coming up with, um, which is a way of kind of teaching um, computer science, but away from um, away from the computer. So, for example, acting out, sort out sorting algorithms and stuff like that. There's like a whole range of them, and they're really awesome, and they can be quite a good icebreaker as well. One minute. Um, 
and uh, basically like join forces with people who are already doing really awesome stuff. Um, like take a look at Tim Bell's work with CS Unplugged. Um, there's gather workshops, which are at the high school level. There's Code Club Aotearoa, which is a primary school level. Um, Mind Lab, Code Avengers, Future in Tech. Um, and there's like, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So um, if you want to know more about these things, then come and find me later or tomorrow or something like this, and I'll like gladly talk to you more about it. Great, the end. Thank you very much, Grace. <laughs> Hello? Hmm. Cool. Um, so, uh, Jordi Tablada, if you can come and uh, get set up, please. And uh, Marcus Holterman is mm. going to be presenting our, uh, our next good. lightning talk, uh, hopefully. <laughs> shall, we shall we start his timer now? I, th I think so, yeah. Unplug? Um, Unplug? Yep, and replug. Let's try again. There we go. So, let's move this one over here. I'm going to do a live demo. This is awesome. No, I'm not. Uh, yes, I did. Um, who here in the room uses Django? Good point. Uh, <laughs> um, let's start off with creating a project. Um, let's talk about Django's Google Summer of Pro Code project. Um, Tim Graham and I mentored a pro um, student called Access. He actually started or implemented class-based indexes for Django. Um, when this is going fast, then... So let's install the current Django development version. Um, and when we have that done, we can look into how we can actually use them. Let's start a new Django project. And let's call it GSOC. And let's start a new Django um, application. Let's call it example. Now let's start editing the settings. Let's activate the project. Um, and let's edit the models. So let's create a my model, which inherits model. A uh, name, which is a char field, which has a maximum length of 150 characters. And now we create a meta class, and now this is new in 1. Point, it's going to be new in 1.11. There's an indexes attribute, which is a model of type, or it's a model index. This takes a fields attribute, which is a list of fields, field names you can define. And it takes the required um, thing name, which is the one, the name the index will have on a database. Now let's create the um, migrations and oops, see what the migrations look like. Why is it not showing? This is bad. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, example, there we go. So what you can see down here, we have this new index. Awesome. Now let's do something, well, Django was, you were able to do this with a DB index on the field. What's new in, well, what's also new is that you can have other types of indexes, for example, gen indexes. Let's go on uh, Postgres. Let's change this to uh, Django database um, and open the model again. Let's go in there and import the um, Postgres JSON field, for example. And the uh, gen index for Postgres uh, for from the Postgres extension, or from the Postgres uh, dependent indexes. Now let's add the JSON field here and add the eh, add the <laughs> with a default of an empty default and let's, uh, let's add a gin index here. Um, One minute. So, so much time. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, now let's see, make migrations. Um, let's run pip install psychopg2 because that's what we need to do before. Um, and we should be able to see the gin index being created when we look at the SQL output here. Damn. <laughs> recording screen sessions or recording session um, batch sessions is apparently not entirely working. Um, give me a second to replay everything. Um, <laughs> I guess I failed. Watch <laughs> fast typing, Marcus. It's amazing. <laughs> um, now, so P SQL. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I was sure such a, a fast typist as yourself would have been able to finish the entire demo in five minutes. F fewer typos next time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so Tim Penhay, if you can uh, come and get mic'd up, that would be fantastic. And uh, Jordi Tablada is about to tell us about Wagtail and meetups. Oh, yeah. Pause it. This is not fair to him. It's actually a technical issue. It's not his fault. So. Right. Yep. Okay, I'll reset his timer. This will take 30 seconds, hopefully. What should just work? Not when the FPGA is off. Yeah, once you can get Mac OS I'll running on an FPGA. Oh, well. oh, he's now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Jordi. I work for Coordinates in Wellington, and uh, I'd like to talk a bit uh, about Wagtail. I believe there was a presentation last year at PyCon about Wagtail, but uh, um, maybe some of you already know about it. Um, I wasn't there, so uh, I'd just like to uh, um, make this uh, Introduction. So uh, Wagtail is a CMS. Um, it was uh, originally developed by uh, Torchbox, which is a UK-based um, agency, and they um, open sourced the project uh, two and a half or three years ago. Um, it's um, Python, obviously. It runs on top of uh, Django, and it comes with um, you know a bunch of features that make it very, very attractive for uh, developers, and um, that's why I started using it. Um, it's uh, yeah. So as I said, it's been around for uh, two and a half years, and it has already like a good um, user uh, um, community. It's really easy to uh, get involved, and um, uh, it's been using around the world not only by Torchbox, its original um, creators, but uh, agencies uh, all over the world, um, people in the in the U.S. And uh, it's been um, used a lot already in uh, New Zealand and Australia. So there's a web agency um, called Springlot in Wellington. They're using it heavily. And there's another web agency in Australia, um, Take Flight, that uh, are using it. So um, it's been um, used by uh, big websites like um, the New Zealand Festival or um, Red Cross, um, New Zealand Red Cross. Um, uh, contributors are all over the world, as I said. Um, there are online demos that you can go and see, um, have a play with it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, using it for really small sites. Uh, you can use Lector for that or maybe a Flask. But if you really need um, a heavy CMS that is going to be uh, used by several users at the same time, you need a good uh, workflow for your um, content editors and uh, you need a good user experience at the same time. Um, I would definitely recommend Wagtail. It comes with a bunch of things that are very useful from a development point of view. Um, uh, really easy to uh, um, plug with Elasticsearch, which is definitely a useful thing to have. Um, you can plug your own uh, template engine, uh, Django templates, Jinja. Um, it comes with a form builder as well. Um, excellent documentation. I don't know. I guess uh, because it's based on the, on top of Django, they wanted to keep the same level of quality um, doc-wise. So that's uh, really good, and it comes um, with an API package that. Um, oops. 
Um, it uh, uses the Django REST framework, which is awesome. And uh, you can share the content of your pages across um, any other applications that you have uh, using that. So that's really good. It can handle you know, a good amount of pages. So uh, this example, um, uh, more than 10,000 nodes. Um, and uh, this website is the one that I was showing you. This was developed by Springload along with uh, uh, Masi Yuri. Well, it's, uh, yeah. Um, uh, this was scraping, scraping the flags from the government site and um, creating one page for each flag and uh, using Wagtail, and it was awesome. And uh, well, besides the product, <laughs> oh my God! Um, yeah. Um, well, there's a bunch of uh, repos that I wanted to show you, um, <laughs> like the yeah, the, the Wagtail itself. Um, you can see the uh, a good amount of uh, users. Uh, um, already, it's easy to stack in and um, to get stuck in. Sorry, and uh, basically, I wanted to share my personal experience with these projects because it was the first one that I um, personally um, got it involved with. And there's uh, usually in open source, there's this um, you can get quite intimidated or um, you don't know how to contribute to something. Um, one this minute. was a good example to um, in, and a good experience because the the guys uh, running the project are quite uh, welcome, and uh, it was easy to. Uh, um, contribute to it, and this uh, led uh, to my first contribution to uh, Django that got merged like two weeks ago. So, yay! yay. <laughs> um, and uh, this also led led me to uh, um, create the Wellington Wagtail CMS meetup um, uh, along with the Springload. Uh, yesterday, someone was uh, um, during uh, I think Lucy's uh, talk saying. Um, what if I'm not a native English speaker? Uh, look, go ahead, do it. Um, people are going to come. Now I get messages every week that, uh, when's the next meetup? So really, um, just uh, go ahead and do it. Thanks. Thanks, Jordi. And uh, you know, we, we know that the AV people should be not seen uh, ideally. But everybody, please thank Ryan Werner for fixing everything during the middle of that talk. Yay, Ryan. <laughs> Um, Alex Hogue, if you can come and get mic'd up, please. And in the meantime, uh, Tim Penhay is going to tell us about push notifications. All right, so Tommy asked me to, uh, if I was going to do a talk this year, and I was like, yeah, 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 and never got around to submitting it properly. So this is my talk very shortly. So push notifications, we've got a startup, um, and it's a Django app with Postgres database, and uh, we've got users who have phones. Um, and we want to notify them of changes. Let me see if I can just get that big cursor off. Right, so we've got iPhone users, um, because for some reason they're popular. We've got Android users, um, and I don't really care if we have any other users, because I'm not going to deal with their phones anyway. Um, so we've created an iPhone and Android apps, and I actually use um, Xamarin Forms for that, so C Sharp. Uh, we won't get into that here. So Apple has this thing called Apple Push Notification Service. Um, it also has a sandbox version, which is the only thing you can do if you're not going through the App Store. Um, it's a royal pain in the ass to use. Um, and Android's got the Google Cloud Messaging Service. Um, so we wanted to notify our users of you know, things that happen. Um, so what we have to do is, when you install the app, you have to run a particular API call appropriate to the phone that will give you a token that identifies that phone. Um, so that identifies the phone to the push service itself. You then, what you need to do is tell your app about that token. So when the user logs into the app, we then go and get a token, and we know who the user is there, and so they then push that token up to our web page. So we have a page which you can send the tokens up to. Um, so now we've got that token up on the web server, so what I'm using is Celery for asynchronous task execution on the server, um, and with a Python library called Botto, which allows us to talk to AWS services. AWS has got a service called the Simple Notification Service, and that abstracts nicely Apple and Google's end user endpoints. So what we do is um, we receive a, an end, a call on the web server. Um, we then create an asynchronous task to register that phone endpoint. Because Google, uh, AWS won't talk directly to those endpoints, you need to give them a token, and they give you a different token. 
So, so that's, they, you got your GCM token, you give it to them, they'll give you a, an SNS token, and that's what you use to talk to SNS. So we then need to store that token against the user in our database, and we have someone that comes along and says, right, we're going to make a change on your system. So we want the user's going to, the system, the website, uh, someone's busy doing stuff on it, and we want to send out notifications to our users. So let's say someone's cancelled a game, because that's something that we'd kind of like people who are supposed to be at the game to have their little phones go bing, right? Because let them know something's going on. So we have, um, someone's edited the, edited the event, the event's been changed, we go, oh, so that view post initiates an asynchronous task to send off the push notification. Salary worker will then pick up that task, queries the database to find all the affected users. We then got all the affected users, we get all the SNS tokens for those users. We then construct the wonderful SNS payload, um, and then we send that data to every token, and the phones go bing, and there were many, many, many issues. And uh, maybe I should have done a real talk and we could have covered them, but I'm done. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Barry and Rob, uh, you are up next to get mic'd up, though we only have one spare mic, so we'll figure out what to do with that. Um, but first, uh, Alex Hogue is going to present something. I can't actually read his handwriting, uh, so I'm, I'm sure it will be very interesting. Um, thanks, Alex. Thanks. Uh, can you all hear me? Is this microphone happening? Okay, good. Yeah? Okay, so earlier this morning, Tommy said, uh, you can give a lightning talk on anything. And so I'm here to uh, really destroy the structural integrity of lightning talks at KiwiPyCon and uh, leave a smoking crater where it used to be. So um, does anyone want to see a magic trick? Yeah. 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 Okay, let's, okay, let's do it. Um, so does anyone have three ropes that I can... Okay, it's all right. I bought some. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> so, but like just in case. Did someone put their hand up? I don't think so. So I have uh, these really organized ropes here. And uh, you can just trust me that they're completely normal ropes. And so I'm just going to start the trick. No, no, I'm not. Um, can I get somebody to look at these and convince themselves they're normal? Anyone? Sure. Thank you. Oh, no, so, sure. Tom doesn't know what normal is. <laughs> <laughs> so take those ropes and look at them for as long as you like and convince yourself that they are not stretchy, that they are not magnetic, that they are not AWS Amazon Cloud enabled. <laughs> Make sure... They are like super fat shoelaces. Yeah, that's right. And so people, people have accused me of some weird stuff, so that's why I'm being clear. Uh, and how, what's, what's going on with the ends of the ropes? Uh, they are different lengths. All three of them are different lengths. One of them is very short, one's a little longer, and one's pretty long. Okay, that's good about the length, but what's going on with the ends of the rope? They are like little shoelaces. They've got uh, tabs on the end. Yeah, they have... They have sticky tape, sellotape? Uh, yeah, I, I did sticky tape the ends of those ropes. Cool. Okay, are you convinced that they're regular ropes and not trick ropes? Sure, why not? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am convinced. Good. Anyone can... Anyone can... I offer my guarantee. <laughs> Tom's guarantee. What, what could go wrong? So, um, oh yeah, by the way, if you, if you think you know how this trick works, don't say anything and keep, keep my secret for everyone else. It makes it more fun for them. So, uh, now, that you, now, that you look the rope, now that you've looked at the ropes, uh, could you just say how you describe the length again? Uh, one's like half a meter, one's a bit shorter, and one's very short, like 10 centimeters. Look, okay, I was going to go for short, medium, and long, but that, look, that'll do. Sure. Like, <laughs> some people can't handle it. Never ask a programmer. <laughs> Some people can't handle it. It's like short, medium, uh, like, they're like, how short are they? And uh, what are the lengths? And people are like short and really short. And that one's got sticky tape on it. People can't handle it. Um, <laughs> anyway, for this trick, I'm going to make it look like they're all the same length. Obviously, they're all different lengths because you just saw them, but it's going to look like they're the same length. So it's a trick of the light optical illusion thing, I think. So uh, you, you're going you're to have to tell me when they look the same length. So do they look the same length now? Say no. Good, you guys are getting good at this. Okay, so but you're gonna, but you have to tell me if they start looking the same length, you have to say yes and clap or something. So do they look, do they look the same length now? No. No. What about like like this? No. Mm, optical illusion. Uh, so what? Okay, what if I cover up the middle like this? Now do they look the same length? Yep. yep. Yeah, they all look really short, but not like this, right? <laughs> so it's it's only good like that. So um, what I do what I do is I just like stretch them and pull them like this. So do they look? Does it now do they look the same length? Yeah. Oh, yeah. everyone's like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, look, if this trick is too confusing with uh, three ropes, we can just do it with two ropes. That's fine. And I'll keep this one in my pocket right here. And uh, if the trick's too confusing with two ropes, that's okay. I have, like, I, I'm, not, I'm not a hater, so we can just do it with one long rope. That's okay as well. <laughs> and so um, the thing about having one long rope is it has one middle and two ends. Yeah, and so if you don't think about it too hard, and please don't, then you can move the ends to be somewhere else. Stop thinking about it. Don't do it. And uh, if you have like magic hand scissors like me, then you can just cut the ropes and be back to two ropes where you started. Um, but sometimes, when you're doing your, your weird magic trick rope thing, you, um, 
Uh, okay, here we go. You have your two ropes and you turn them into one long rope and you have your one long rope and the thing about one long rope is it has one middle and two ends. And the thing about having one middle and two ends is sometimes you get really carried away and you go way too far. And now you have, <laughs> now you have just like this thing and like two little ends. And like the trick is ruined, you can't do it like this. And so to get it to go back on, it's easy. You just massage it gently like this and it goes back on. <laughs> Uh, you have to be gentle though. So if I want to do this trick again, I have to do the whole thing with the magic hand scissors and getting back to two ropes. And now if I want to make them all look the same length, then they already do look the same length. Uh, so I need, someone, I need someone's help to, uh, get me to, to get them back to being different length. Um, Oscar, can you help me? Do you know how to tie a knot? Can you tie a knot? One minute. No, no pressure, but... <laughs> Here, could you, could you take this rope, please, and just tie it to the end of one of these? Any knot you want. Uh, feel free to phone a friend with a knot if you want. <laughs> okay, whoa, Oscar's doing it by himself. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, that's a, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a knot, sure. <laughs> okay, so now you can see my knot and Oscar's knot down here. And so you can see that roughly they're all the same length except for this one because of the knot, but it's fine. And so to get them to be back from the beginning, you just move the knot. You just go like that, don't think about it, please. And uh, then when you undo it, uh, here's the short one, and here's the medium one, and here's the long one. Uh, this Oscar. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, uh, Jürgen Brendel, Jürgen, if you can come and get mic'd up. Wait, no, we do. Oh, wait, we will have a spare mic, hopefully. Um, but first, uh, Barry and uh, Robert are going to tell us about sprinting. And their time has started. Right. Check. Yep. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Barry and I are running Sea Path and Development Sprints at Tommy's Request tomorrow. And we want to rem not tomorrow, Monday. Okay. Monday. Monday. Well, you guys should give the lightning talk because clearly we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> but we do know about CPython and its internals and how to work with the code and the bug trackers and get patches up. So if you'd like to help make Python better, uh, you should be there on Monday and Tuesday and that's all I have. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that, when, you, when, that, you, when you said talk loudly, yeah. that, that's not what I thought. That's how enthusiastic <laughs> I am about sprints. Uh, so I've been going to PyCons for years and years and years and I really think that the sprints are probably the most fun that you can have um, at, a, at a Python conference. Um, you get to sit in a room with a bunch of other people who have uh, similar interests, and you just get to dive into code, and you get to do what you think is fun, and uh, you... Uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, it, you can be... Uh, so, for this sprint, I think, you, you know, it, if you know C, that's great. You can dig into the... Um, C yeah, Python yeah. Inter in internals, but don't, don't feel like you have to because uh, there's lots of Python uh, in Python, in Python yeah, to do yeah. as well, yeah. uh, the standard library. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about um, how to do how to clone the repos and um, look at the bugs and uh, create and, patches and, and get a building on your machine. That's it sometimes build. a bit tricky. And yep, yeah, exactly. We've, Use, we've probably seen all the ways it fails. I think. Yeah. Uh, so I think you can pretty much do it. I, I know, um, you know, Linux we should be pretty, pretty um, comfortable with, uh, but we could probably do it on Mac as well. And, and I can, I can solve Windows as well. Yep. So, uh, you know, I encourage you to come to the sprints because they're, they're a lot of fun. <laughs> Anything else? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. Check the conference details. It's on Tommy, the page. Do, do you? Is there a limit to the number of people that can? No. Yeah, okay, so there is a limit to the number of people, so <laughs> if we go over the limit, you can pay either Rob or I um, to you get in. You can pay me. <laughs> I don't say anything about where you get in. It's at the University of Otago. Um, the details are on the NZ Park uh, website. Yeah, it's not here, though. It is somewhere else. No, it no, is somewhere else. At the university. Yeah. I've yeah. said that three times. At the university. Where? Polytech. The university. Polytech. Polytech. At the Polytech. <laughs> don't let me okay. up front. So if you, want to, uh, if you want to not sprint on CPython on Monday and Tuesday, show up at the university campus. <laughs> and for those of you who are interested in learning a bit more about the internals of CPython, perhaps getting your first contribution landed, uh, go, see, uh, go see Barry and Rob at Otago Polytech uh, later, on, uh, later on on Monday. Um, so, uh, next on my list is somebody who's listed themselves as not Katie McLaughlin. Uh, so, if Graham could come and line up. <laughs> and in the meantime, uh, Jürgen Brendel is going to tell us some stuff. 
Hey. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So um, I just looked it up. The Java programming language is 21 years old. Yeah. It can drink in the States, and that's probably a good thing. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and Python? Anyone know? 24? 25. 25. 25 this year. Python is older than Java. But for some inexplicable reason, Java went all mainstream and everything. Python not. And I guess the reason is pretty clear. Uh, Java had a big corporate sponsor behind it, and still has. And so anyway, the rest is history, as they say. But I have a question here, and I have actually a, b a bunch of questions. That's what I'm, what I'm really here for. And I wanted to know from you, if I could just see a show of hands, how many of you have learned Python in the last two years? All right, all right. And of those, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now keep your hands up if you have learned Python because of university or, or your employer, your work. Uh, okay, so I think a bit more than half. All right, okay, cool. Now, let's go back a few more years. Uh, how many of you have learned Python around 10 years ago? Uh, around like eight to eight or older. Let's say eight, eight years or longer. Eight oh, years longer. Long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. How many, how many of you, how many of those with hands up? Keep them up. Keep them up. How many of those did so because of uni or your work required it? That is less than half. That's less than half. So I think what we can see from this is that Python, okay, I just said, Python has gone mainstream in many ways. You can find job ads for Python developers, and that just wasn't the case you know, five, six, ten years ago to such an extent. If large, dodgy companies like Cisco and, and telcos and such, if they can employ hordes of Python developers, you know it has gone mainstream. But there used to be the time when Python was the hot new thing, and you had to go to your organization, which was doing C Sharp or Visual Basic or Java or some other crappy thing, and you have to tell them, hey, let's use Python for something because it's cool and it's great and you can really get stuff, stuff done. But what do we see here at this PyCon? We have two talks by traitors who want to talk about <coughs> Rust People who like other languages. and Golang, the outrage. So, <laughs> so, so my, my question now is, I, I will admit the fact that I work for a company which does Golang stuff as well. Anyway, so, <laughs> um, so my question is, Python is not the new hotness anymore. It's not the latest cool thing. It's just a very well-developed, well-established tool. So have we seen the peak hype, hype cycle for Python? Have, have we gone past it? Have we seen? I don't know if we have seen peak Python. Enterprise is still uh, uh, adopted. But are we past the hype cycle? Are people, are developers looking out for new languages, new stuff? What do you think? Who, who agrees? Who would agree with that? Who would agree with that, that Python really isn't the latest and greatest anymore? <laughs> All right. All of those out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I, just, I just wanted to just, uh, that was really my, my, my question here. Is this, is, is, uh, the rest of you still think that Python is you know, the greatest thing out there? Yeah. Greatest programming language? Don't want to learn anything else? One minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, and it's amazing to see if someone could learn Python like eight, ten years ago. Um, that has a huge amount of energy. Um, because the tools that were being used by statisticians to do R were kind of clunky for anything else that wasn't static. You know yeah. we have another slot for lightning talks, Tim. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> but hey, 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 I, I want to say something. That I'm, I'm really glad to hear this because I would love to keep working on Python. So I'm encouraged to hear that there are still a lot of growth going on in Python, all right? Anyway, that was just what I was thinking about because I saw these other talks. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, so Ian Rees, if you can come and get mic'd up, please, wherever you are. Ian, you're around. Great. Um, so 
Our next presentation is by not Katie McLaughlin, who is presenting about not Tom Eastman. <laughs> and your time has started. So hopefully you're all here yesterday when you saw the talk. Is that a problem? Okay. So, so what happened yesterday? We had Tom Easton and Katie McLaughlin did a, his, a talk of his. So let's consider this in Python though. So we have a class called Tom Easton who has a who I am, I am a returns Tom Easton. So we create an instance of Tom Easton and we print the result of that and we get Tom Easton. Okay. We have a class for Katie McLaughlin, same thing. We're going to print out who am I and we're going to get Katie McLaughlin. All looks good so far. Now, Katie made the statement that she was not Tom Easton. But is that actually correct? <laughs> If not Tom Easton, we'll print not Tom Easton, otherwise we'll print Tom Easton. What's the answer? Tom Easton. <laughs> so I don't think her statement's right. So what about, maybe she meant to compare this to the type and not the instance of Tom Easton. So we'll go if not Tom Easton. And the answer is, no, it's Tom Easton. Both of those fail because the only way that that can be correct is that it's, you're comparing to none. And we've actually recompared to an instance and a type. And so they're both always true. Okay? So that's why it fails. <laughs> Let's see what Graham has to say. So maybe she meant this. Maybe if Katie McLaughlin is not Tom Easton, is this going to work? It, Katie is not Tom. So yes, maybe this is actually what, what she meant. Now, just to make sure where our logic is correct, is if Katie is not Katie, what are we going to get? Well, we get Katie's Katie, so it's good. We look, we look like we're doing fine. Now, what though if, if, if science actually got cloning to work? And we had more than one instance of Tom Easton. And we, had, we had a whole room full of Tom Eastons here. <laughs> the previous check worked because we were comparing the ID of the object of each one. And so we were actually just looking at IDs. So what we really want here is we actually want to compare to the type because there's this whole room of you where you want to know whether she's actually this, uh, going to be uh, not an instance of any of the Tom instance. And so if not instance of Katie of Tom Easton, then Katie McLaughlin. Okay, so it works. Good. We're doing well. So, <laughs> <laughs> now what Katie was actually doing was she was actually being a proxy for Tom in some way. She was pretending to be Tom. So we can do this with wrapped, because in wrapped we have an object thing called an object proxy. So we can create an instance of Tom. We then create an instance of Katie, which has wrapping Tom as a proxy. So we print out Tom Easton, who am I? Is Tom Easton. We print out Katie McLaughlin, who am I? Tom Easton. So she was pretending to be Tom. So what else can we do here? Is Katie McLaughlin an instance of Tom, of type? And the answer is Tom Easton. So Katie is actually Tom. <laughs> Did I get this right? I've mucked something up there. <laughs> uh, keep going. Um, so this is, yeah, I've said something up. So this is Katie of Tom, no, of Katie, okay. So Katie is Tom, but let's make sure, and Katie is an instance of herself. And the answer is yes. So Katie's actually both Tom and Katie at the same time when we use this proxy. Mm, okay, so how then do we know which is the real Katie? Okay. <laughs> In that case, well, we need to look at the type. So the type of Katie is Tom Easton. Is that Tom Easton? And no, it's not. It's not Tom. So the way we determine whether it is Katie is we look at the type. So what do we learn? <laughs> that you Everyone have one cats, minute. Okay. <laughs> no, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, and this is where, as a, a newbie to Python, you can get a bit complicated in times in terms of when you need to use not equals or is or is not, uh, how to compare types and so on. There's all this complexity around this. Um, so yeah, so it can get messy. So when you're doing stuff with types especially, do make sure you're using the right construct to compare things. Otherwise, it can get, become a mess. So in the end, who am I? Graham Dompton, I'm an instance, and I am not an instance, I'm not an instance of either Tom or Katie, okay? True. <laughs> Thank you. I've always, I've always wanted to say this on stage. Dumpleton! <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks for that, Graham. Um,
Tim Mitchell, if you can come and get uh, mic'd up. And uh, before that, we have Ian Rees, who is going to tell us about Python at the South Pole. Apparently, yeah. the place is further south than here. Who That's knew? Right. And colder. <laughs> Let's see. So I got HTML right there. Cool. <laughs> Where is my mouse? There we are. Sorry. Yeah. How do we, how do we see? Yeah. Trying to find the find the cursor. Left. There we go. Sweet. Send an arrangement. Mirror displays. Cool. So uh, I should apologize that I was looking around for the source for this talk, and all I could find was this PDF. So um, this talk was made about 18 months ago for a pretty different, pretty different audience. Uh, it's obviously not working. Uh, cool. Does this, this make it a little bit better? <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so instead of talking about the how or the um, what or the why, we're talking about a little bit, little bit about where. Um, so I, I was really fortunate uh, a couple years ago to get a job working for IceCube. It's a neutrino telescope um, located at the South Pole. So it's sort of a job that's kind of a mix between a bunch of different um, sort of sysadmin, sort of programming, uh, a bit of shoveling, all sorts of random other jobs. Um, so IceCube is a neutrino detector that works um, basically by detecting uh, Sharenkov radiation. I don't really understand it, but the idea is essentially that you bury a bunch of things that are like CRT TVs wired backwards in a bunch of ice, and you can detect neutrinos. Um, so my buddy uh, Dog, the second guy in this talk, um, he's the physicist. <laughs> um, so this talk was uh, a bit about our, our year at South Pole. Um, this is a bunch of stuff that's only really relevant if if you want to get a job at South Pole. Um, it's a long way to get, uh, let's see, let's see, this is not going. Uh, could we get unplugged, replugged? Yeah. So. There we go. <coughs> okay, so um, you, get to, you get to South Pole by way of Christchurch most of the time. Um, so there's a Basically, a flight that takes you down to McMurdo Station. It's further south. You can take a boat, and then from there, you take another another uh, plane to the South Pole. Um, fly cargo class, which is kind of fun, in the back of a C-130 um, with skis. It's a pr pretty cool plane. Um, McMurdo Station is kind of what people think about. I think when they're when they're thinking about Antarctica, it's got uh, penguins, got um, animals, that water, sometimes. Where in contrast, uh, South Pole is, is incredibly high and dry. It's uh, about 3,000 meters, um, pretty much nothing there, not, definitely nothing alive. Year-round average temperature is about negative, uh, what does it work out to be? Negative 50-something C. Um, so we were doing computer work down there, though. Um, IceCube gets uh, quite a bit of data um, from these, from these um, what, are they, what are they called, the photomultiplier tubes. Um, about a terabyte a day which all gets stored on tape, uh, or at least when we were there, all got stored on tape. So I don't know how many folks are familiar with tape, but that's LTO3 data tape. Um, hooks up with Ultra 320 SCSI, so it's kind of, kind of old stuff. But it turns out that newer tapes don't really work down there uh, due to problems with static, that sort of thing. Um, so we, in, our, in our winter, um, we had some pretty severe problems with tapes. This is my buddy, uh, Doug, who's the, the other Ice Cube guy that was down there, um, trying to sort out which tapes are good and bad. Quite interesting. Um, yeah, so the th same effect that drives the seasons in most of the world drives your sunrise and sunset at South Pole. Um, so that means that the sunset and sunrise um, are kind of kind of a big deal. Um, it, it, it gets a, it gets a bit um, a bit too cold in the winter to fly airplanes. Uh, you might have heard in the news. Um, what was it two or three months ago? There was a, a winter medical evacuation from South Pole. I think it was the third one that's ever ever happened. Um, does not sound like a fun time to me. Uh, about nine months of the year, no planes in or out, so it's just you and 40 other crazy people. Um, <coughs> just a little bit of fresh fruit. Uh, fresh fruit uh, gets brought down at the last, so the last air, last big airplane at least. Um, so that doesn't doesn't really last a terribly long time. Let's see. Stuff, stuff we do down there. The station's actually quite large. Um, we've got a gymnasium, uh, although you'll find that mo most people don't actually get to use that too much just because the elevation is such that um, 
you spend most of your time bent over breathing <laughs> um, <laughs> or trying to. Uh, a lot of books, a lot of movies, a lot of really interesting and talented people. Um, you know, the, the guys that are in this band on the top left are all sort of other, other geeks. Oh, sorry. We're out of time. Oh. Sorry. Sweet. Cool. Uh, Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thank you, Ian. That was cool. Um, so uh, we're starting to actually run quite low on time. We have five talks left in the list and probably only time for three of them. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, if uh, Menno Finlay Smiths can come and uh, can come and uh, mic up, that would be fantastic. Uh, but first, Tim Mitchell is going to tell us about uh, SQLite. I have nothing. Okay, my talk's actually SQLite and Unicode. Who thinks this is going to be a happy story? <laughs> <laughs> Two, three people. The Unicode wow. just works. Optimists, optimists. Um. Uh, check my display settings again. Multiple displays. Go down. Turn it down. Last display settings. Twelve eighty seven twenty. Uh, go down. Actually, you might change Technology. Mm -hmm. uh, display adapter properties. Display adapter property. Get a monitor. Versus 60 hertz, uh, that should be fine. Okay, yeah. just give it a sec. It should be right. Should be right. Sec. Is it? Should we try extending instead? Wouldn't make a difference looking at your display extending at all. No. No display. <laughs> okay, so Python does Unicode. Uh, Python has database. That database is SQL Lite. Um, and that uh, database supports Unicode. You can create text columns, you can stick Unicode objects in them, you get Unicode in your database, you can pull it out. However, you can put Unicode in, you can put Unicode out, but if you try and do anything with Unicode in SQLite, oh dear. So if you read the SQLite documentation um, and you talk, read up about case collation, ASCII only. So if you try and select lower case column C, um, you are still going to get all your upper cases, A tilde's, anything that's not your bulk standard A to Z. Um, so this was a huge pain point for us because uh, we were just merely writing software and selling to Eng you know, England and Australia and the US. Then we started selling to Spanish and the people putting rock codes in with tilde's and other accents and, you know, our Python code said they were the same, our database said they weren't. <laughs> um, so um, that was our pain point. Um, however, uh, you read up on the SQLite document, you can build it with Unicode support, that's awesome, and you look at it and this, this is going to be really tricky. And, oh, the Unicode support doesn't support case folding. Okay, oh, there's this in Unicode. You can use that instead. You can build it with that uh, if you're on Linux. But we're on Windows. Okay. We can build it. Hooray. We've got it working. Hooray. And it has a different case mapping table to Python. <laughs> <sighs> okay. However, um, SQLite Connect um, database has, um, allows you to create your own functions and your own collations. So you simply connect to SQLite go create collation, no case, and you pass it in a function that takes two strings, uppercases them, and compares them. Okay, so it makes your queries really slow in some instances because you're calling back into Python for every comparison, but you can actually make uh, SQLite um, do case folding exactly the same as Python, and you can avoid a lot of pain by doing so. Thank you, that's my talk. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So um, let's see, to mic up next, uh, we have uh, David uh, Dudson, I think. Um, 
But first, uh, we have uh, Menno who's going to tell us about IMAP client. Uh, I was hoping to just flip it up on the other screen. Yeah, yeah no, that's not a big deal. Okay, cool. Okay, how do that? No, that's definitely not working right. Yeah, so that window, slide that window down. Yeah, that's easier said than done. easier said than done. Alright, I'll okay. Yep. Hang on, I think it's I've totally lost the window. There we are, and for some reason it doesn't want to go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's what I was trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Hey, don't trust a room full of programmers to whistle on impromptu. Doesn't matter. Don't need it. <laughs> we'll just skip that. All right. Um, yeah, go for it. You, good, good luck for figuring out my window setup, windowing setup. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I'm talking about IMAP client, which is a project I maintain. Um, Everybody know, don't worry about it, it's really not that important. Um, does everybody know what IMAP is? I guess just about everyone will. It's get, it gets an email from an email server. Um, you've got folders and all sorts of amazing stuff. It's quite an old, archaic sort of protocol, uh, which makes it really fun to work with. Um, uh, you, if you've ever, has anyone here tried to use IMAP lib in the standard library? Yeah? Did anyone enjoy it? <laughs> Yeah, IMAP lib's pretty crafty. Um, it, it, it's very low level. It doesn't try to do very much for you, which means that everybody who uses it ends up doing the same horrible hacks using regexes and their own string splitting and all sorts of horrible things. So uh, a long, long, long time ago, I needed to deal with IMAP in the first job I was working at. And I started using IMAP lib, and I realized this is terrible, and there's nothing better out there. So I started a, a project which ended up being IMAP client. Um, the big, big wins when you're using IMAP client is you don't have to do all that horrible trickery, um, splitting strings. I was going to show some examples, but hey, the project doesn't work. Um, yeah, and the other really thing, nasty thing about IMAP lib is it doesn't really emit, it generate many exceptions. So um, you end up having to, after everything you do with the IMAP server, go and check did that work, <laughs> uh, which is you know not very Pythonic. Uh, so IMAP client fixes all those kinds of things. It deals with Unicode properly now, finally. Um, uh, it works from Python version 2.6 right up to 3.5, skipping some of the early threes. Who cares about those? Um, and yeah, it just makes your life a whole lot better. Uh, so if you ever need to use IMAP with Python, don't reach for IMAP lib, reach for IMAP client. That's it. Uh, website is imapclient.freshview.com. That's it. Well, thanks for that, Menno. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, this next one is the last we have time for, given the, uh, the time constraints I've been given. Um, so for those of you who submitted a lightning talk uh, but uh, didn't get a chance to present it, I'm um, kind of sorry about that. Uh, we might have time tomorrow. I'm not sure. Um, David is going to be talking to us about uh, Git Python. We'll just use a mode. It's fine. Free. Oh, it doesn't really matter. And we'll just. Oh, uh, that's not full screen. We'll deal with it. Um, I'll just go. Anyway, um, so can I get a quick show of hands as to who does not use Python for their day to day development, who actually uses something else? And can you keep your hands up if you use Git? Oh, still lots of people. Um, and who uses Python for command line tooling? Oh, no one. Good. Oh, oh sorry. Including the people that we're just talking about. Um, OK, so what is Git Python? Well, there's a, um, it's basically just a library for interacting with Git at um, the Pythonic level. And it's, it's very simple to use. 
Um, and we have problems such as the ones on the screen right now um, that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis that we shouldn't really be thinking about. They should just be working. Um, this is a lot simpler than something like a linter or um, you know, any other like Sonar servers or anything like this. Just simple white space, simple naming conventions, stuff that you can do through regexes, stuff that you can do just by looking at a file. Um, you know, checking your copyright notices have the right year on them. Um, that sort of stuff is, is so stupidly simple and half the time you don't think about it and bugs slip, well not bugs, but formatting tweaks um, slip through because 990 times out of 1000 you'll get it right and there'll be that one time that you get it wrong. Um, and when do you actually catch these issues? Um, most people I should imagine don't catch them on commit unless you've seen it while you've been developing. Um, code reviewers might pick it up um, but it's not their job. Their job should not be to check that your white space is correct. It should be that your code works and as it was intended. Um, and your static analysis tool might also pick this stuff up, um, but chances are you're not going to be running your static analysis tool on every commit. It's going to take 24 to 48 hours before you actually check it. And by then you're beyond that branch, you've pushed out your code and things are going, you know, it's, it's there, you have to add another commit to change the formatting and this sort of stuff. Um, so here's some random example code for a really simple problem. Um, we just uh, create the repo object from a path and check that it's not bare. And then we list all the commits starting at a reference point, which is the head. Um, and then we uh, just go through the commits and call a random function, which we have to find up the top, um, just to check for problems. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit complicated um, because we're dealing with git and git deals with blobs and diffs and, and this sort of stuff. Um, so what we want to do is we want to diff two things together and we want to make sure we create a patch um, because this will actually show us the actual code and not just numbers and hashes and things like this. Um, so we get a list of indexes, and, well, a, a diff index is the list type. And we sort of iterate through them and we have to go through um, whether we're looking for modifications, renames, additions, deletions, this sort of stuff. Um, and we can filter all that stuff out and then we roll our own function to check for problems and we can get each sort of blob of um, your commits and see whether or not you've added problems or removed problems or you can do crazy stuff with it. Um, so I'm not going to write anything like this for the purposes of this lightning talk um, but I'm just saying it's out there and what you should really do um, and what I have on my dev machine is I've set it up so it checks the blobs, gets line numbers, gives you the exact um, problem with the code with a line number and um, it's automated to an extent where you can automatically fix up the code by knowing exactly what's wrong and what line number and what file. Um, and then you can automate the rebase and fix up process by scanning the commit history to find the introductory commit in Python and then rebase that change in without touching anything on the command line and it's all just one command. Um, and you should always sys exit on finding an issue if um, you're doing things through rebasing because this sort of stuff allows you to merge changes with other people's work and then realize that they've introduced a formatting bug or something or it's broken your formatting or something or copyright notice or whatever it is and you can instantly see that because um, your rebase will stop, you can amend it and then continue on. Um, so where do you use this? Hooks, like commit hooks, push hooks, everywhere like this. Um, because you're doing very small regexy type stuff. Oh, thanks for that, David. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, that is basically all the time we, uh, we have because we need to get to dinner. Uh, everybody, please give a round of applause to everyone who presented a lightning talk this evening.